Okay, welcome back everyone to the live CUBE coverage here in Las Vegas for in-person AWS reInvent 2021. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. Two sets, live wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Also, of course, there's a hybrid event as well. Great stuff online. Ton, almost too much information to consume, but ultimately, as usual, great show of, of new innovation for startups and for large enterprises. Got a great guest, Paul Duffy, head of startup solutions architecture for North America for Amazon Web Services. Paul, thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Hey John, good to be here. So we saw you last night, uh, we were chatting kind of uh, about the, the show in general, but also about startups. You know, you know, everyone knows I'm a big startup fan, a big founder myself, and we, we talk, I'm pro startups, everyone loves startups. Amazon, the first real customers were developers doing startups. And we know the big unicorns out there now all started on AWS. So, so Amazon was like, a, like was a dream for the startup because before Amazon, you have to provision the server, you put it in the colo, you need a system <laughs> administrator. Welcome to EC2, goodness is there, the rest is history. Yeah. The legacy in the startups is pretty deep. Yeah. No, and, and you, you, you made the right point. I've done it myself. I co-founded a startup in about 2007, 2008, and before, you know, before we even knew whether we had any kind of product market fit, we were racking servers and doing all that kind of stuff. So, yeah completely changed it. And it's hard too with the new technology now, um, finding someone to actually, I remember when I, we set up our first uh, Hadoop and we ran a solar search engine, I couldn't even find anyone to manage it. Because if, if you knew Hadoop at then, you were working at Facebook or Hyperscaler. So, that, so you guys have all this technology coming out, so provisioning and doing the heavy lifting for start is a huge win. That's kind of known, everyone knows that, so that's cool. What are you guys doing now? Because now you've got large enterprises trying to be like startups. You've got startups coming in with huge white spaces out there in the market. Jerry Chen from Greylock was on yesterday. We talked extensively about the net new opportunities in the cloud that are out there. And now you see companies like Goldman Sachs have super clouds. So there's tons of growth. Yeah. Take us through the white space. How do you guys see startups taking advantage of AWS? In, yeah, I mean, to a whole other level. And I think it's very interesting when you look at how things have changed in those kind of 15 years. The old world, horrible, you had to do all this provisioning. And then with AWS, Adam Salipsky was talking in his keynote on the first day of the event where you know, people used to think it was just good for startups. Now, for startups, it was this kind of obvious thing because they didn't have any legacy, they didn't have any data centers, they didn't have necessarily a large team, and be able to do this thing with no commitment spin up a server with an API call was really the revolutionary thing. In that time, 15 years later, startups still have the same kind of urgency, they're constrained by time, they're constrained by money, they're constrained by the engineering talent they have. And one of, when you hear some of the announcements this week, or you look at what is kind of the building blocks available to those startups, that I think is where the, it, it's become revolutionary. So you take a, a startup in you know, 2011, 2012, and they were trying to build something, maybe they were trying to do image recognition on forms, for example, and they could build that, but they had to build the whole thing in the cloud. We had infrastructure, we had database stuff, but they would have to do all of the kind of the stuff on top of that. Yeah. Now, you look at some of the kind of the AIML services we have, things like Textract, and they could just take that service off the shelf. We've got one startup in Canada called Chisel AI, um, they're, doing, they're trying to disrupt the insurance industry, and they could just use these services like Textract to just accelerate them getting to their product market fit instead of having to do this under the French You know, Paul, you know, we talk about, I remember back in the day when web services, when service-oriented architectures, building blocks, decoupling, APIs, all that's now so real and so excellent, but you brought up a great point. Glue layers had to be built, had to be built. Now you have, with the scale of Amazon Web Services, things are, we're learning from other companies. It reminds me of the open source vibe where you stand on the shoulders of others to get success, and there's a lot of new things coming out that startups don't have to do because startups before them did. Yeah. I, this I, is like a new yeah. cool thing. It's a whole nother level. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a real standing on the shoulders of the giants kind of thing. And if you, and if you just to unpick, like in Werner's um, announcement this morning, his keynote this morning, he was talking about the Amplify Studio kind of stuff. And if you think about the before and after for that, front-end developers have had to do this stuff for a long period of time. And in the before version, they would have to do all that kind of in integration work, which isn't really what they want to spend their time doing. And now, they, they've kind of got that head start. Andy, Andy Jassy famously would say, 
when he talked about building AWS that there is no compre compression algorithm for experience. I like to kind of misuse that phrase for what we try to do for startups is provide these compression algorithms. So instead of having to hire a larger engineering team to do, just do this kind of crufty stuff, they can just take the thing and kind of get from naught to 60. Give, some, way, example. Way Give some examples today of where this is playing out in real time. What kinds of new compression algorithms can startups leverage that they couldn't get before? What's new that's available? I think you see it across all parts of the stack. I mean, you could just take a kind of a database thing. Like in the old, in, in the old days, if you wanted to start and you had the, the dream that every startup has um, of, of getting to kind of hyperscale where things bursting that seems is the problem. If you wanted to do that, the, the, the database layer back in the day, yeah. you would probably have to provision most of that database stuff yourself. And then when you get to some kind of limiting factor, you've got to do that work where all you're really wanting to do is try and add more features to your application. And whether you've got services like Aurora, where that will do all of that kind of scaling from a storage point of view, and it gives that startup the way to, to stand on the shoulders of giants, or the same kind of thing. You want to do some kind of identity, say you're doing a kind of a, a dog walking marketplace or something like that, and one of the things that you need to do for the, the kind of the payments thing is some kind of identity verification. In the old days, you would have to have gone pulled all those primitives together to do the stuff that would look at people's ID and so on. Now people can take things like text tracks, for example, to look at those forms and do that kind of stuff. And you can kind of pick that story in all of these different swim lanes, whether it's compute yeah. stuff, whether it's database, whether it's this higher level AIML stuff, whether it's stuff like Amplify, that just massively compresses that time frame for the startup. Okay, so first of all, I'm totally loving this because this is just an example of how evolution works. But if I'm a startup, one of the big things I would think about, and you're a founder, you know this, you know, opportunity recognition is one thing, opportunity capture is another. So moving fast is what nimble startups do. Maybe there's a little bit of technical debt there, maybe a little business model debt, but they can get beachhead quickly. Right. Startups can move fast, that's the benefit. So where do I learn, if I'm a startup founder, about where all these pieces are. Is there a place that you guys are providing? Is there uh, use cases where founders can just come in and get the best of the best, composable cloud? How do I stand up something quickly to get going that I could re maybe refactor later, but not take on too much technical debt yeah. or just actually have new building blocks? Where's the, where are all these tools yeah, well, at? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that one. So, I mean, for us, startups is, startups is the, the core of what everyone in my team does. And most of the people we, we hire, well, they all have a passion for startups. Some have been former founders, some have been former CTOs, some have come to the passion from a different kind of thing. And they, they understand the needs of startups. And you, when you started to talk about technical debt, one of the, the, the balances that startups have always got to get right is, you're not building for 10 years down the line. You're building to get yourself often to the next milestone, to get the next set of customers, for example. And so we're not trying to, to do the sort of the perfect enemy of, of, of good things. I call it the immaculate conception of startups. Yeah, You don't exactly. need that, you just got to yeah. get in marketplace. Yeah, and, and what, how we try to do that is, um, we've got a program called Activate, and Activate gives startup founders, uh, you know, things like uh, AWS credits, up to $100,000 in credits, it gives them other technical capabilities as well. So we have a part of the, the console, the management console, um, called the Activate console, people can go there. And again, if you're trying to build a back-end API, there is something there, this build on AWS capability we launched recently, that basically says, here is some templatized stuff for you to go from kind of naught to 60 in that kind of thing. So you don't have to spend time searching the web. And for us, we're taking that because we've, we've been there before with a bunch of other startups and we're trying to help. Okay, so how do, do you guys, I mean, there's I mean, a zillion startups. I mean, we could, you and I could be in a coffee shop somewhere, we're like, hey, let's do a startup. Do I get access, everyone gets access to this program that you have, or, or is it an elite thing? Is there a criteria? Is it just, you guys are just out there fostering and evangelizing, building tools? Is there a program? How do you yeah, guys it's vet? A program. How do you guys vet the startups? Is there a, so uh, it, it's a program. It has different levels in terms of benefits. So it's uh, uh, at the core of it. It's open to anybody. So if you were a bootstrap startup tomorrow or today, you can go to the, the Activate website and you can sign, sign up for that self-starting tier. What we also do is we have an extensive set of um, connections with the community. So T1, uh, yeah, 
accelerators and, and incubators, venture capital firms, the kind of places where startups are going to build. And via the relationships with those folks, if you're in one, if, you, if you've kind of got investment from a, a top tier VC firm, for example, you may be eligible for $100,000 of credit. So some of it depends on where the startup is at, but the overall program is open to all. And a chunk of the stuff we talked about, like the guidance, that's there for everybody. It's free. Yeah. That's free, and that's cool, that's good learning. So yeah, and then they get the free training. What's the coolest thing that you're doing right now that startups should know about uh, around, obviously the passion for startups, I know for a fact at AWS, I can say that I've heard Andy and Adam both say that it's not just enterprise anymore, they still love the startups. That's their bread and butter too. Yeah, what's no. new? I, and I, I think to me, the, the, you know, someone, uh, we, we were talking about the keynote, you see some of these large customers in Adam's keynote to people like United Airlines, very, very large, successful enterprise. And if you just look around this show, there's a lot of startups just on this expo floor that we are, we are now. And when I look at these announcements, to me the thing that just gets me excited and keeps me staying doing this job is all of, the, all of these people, all of these little capabilities that make it in, in the environment we're in right now with a good funding environment and all of these technical building blocks that instead of having to take a few um, you know, basic compute and storage ones, you have all of these higher and higher level things you know, the serverless stuff that was announced in Adam's keynote earlier, which is just making it easy. Because if you're a founder, you have an idea, you know the thing that you want to disrupt. And we're letting people do that in different ways. I'll pick one startup that I find really exciting to talk to. It's called Steady. Um, it's run by a guy called Zach Cantor. And he started that startup relatively recently. Now if you started 15 years ago, you were going to use EC2 instances building on the cloud, but you were still using compute instances. Zach is really opinionated and a, a kind of a, a technical, technical t technology visionary in this sense that he takes this serverless approach. And when you talk to him about how he's building, it's almost this attitude of, if I've had to spin up a server, I've kind of failed in some way or it's not the right kind of thing. Why would we do that? Because we can build with these completely different kind of architectures. What was revolutionary 15, 15 years ago, and it's like, okay, you're gonna pay, you can launch a server with an API and you're going to pay by the hour. But now, when you look at how Zach's building, you're not even launching a server and you're paying by the millisecond. Yeah, well this is a huge thing. history lesson slash uh, important point. Back 15 years ago, you had your alternative to, to Amazon was provisioning, which is expensive, time consuming, lagging, and probably causes people to give up, frankly. Now you get that in the cloud, you can roll your own custom domains. I remember EC2 before they had custom domains, it was so, so early. But now, it's about infrastructure as code. Okay, so again, evolution, great time to market, buy what you need in the cloud, and Adam talked about that. Now it's true infrastructure as code. Yeah. So the smart, savvy architects are saying, hey, I'm just going to program. I don't have to, if I'm spinning up servers, that means that's a low level primitive that should be automated. Right. That's the new mindset. Yeah. No, and, that, and that's, that's why, the, the, I mean, the fun thing about being in this industry is, in just in the time that I've worked at AWS since about 2011, this stuff has changed so much. And what was state of the art then? And if you take, it's funny, when you, when you look at some of the, um, the startups that have grown with AWS, like you know, whether it's Airbnb, Stripe, yeah. Slack, and so on, if you look at how they built in 2011, because sometimes new startups will say, oh, we want to go, we want to go and talk to this kind of unicorn and see how they built. And if you actually talk to the unicorn, some of them would say, we wouldn't build it this way anymore. Yeah. We would do you. We would do the kind of stuff that Zach and Ste the, the folks that Steady are doing right now because it's totally, totally yeah. different. What's and on the, the one, and the one thing that's consistent from then to now is only one thing. Has nothing to do with the tech. It's speed. Remember Rails front end with some back end Mongo. You're up on EC2. You got an app. Yeah. In a week, hackathon. Right. Weekend. But that time, and that time, that time thing that just goes, it gets smaller and smaller. Like, like the Amplify thing that Vernon was talking about this morning, you, you, could have, you could have gone back 15 years and it's like, okay, this is how much work the developer would have to do. You could go back a couple of years and it's like, they still have this much work to do. And now this morning, it's like they've just accelerated them to that kind of thing. Well, we'll end on, on giving Jerry Chen a plug in our chat yesterday. We put the playbook out there for startups. You've got a laser focus on the beachhead and solve the problem you got in front of you and then sequence to adjacent positions, refactor in the cloud, take that approach. You don't have to boil the ocean over right away. You get in the market, get in, get automating. Kind of the new playbook. It's just make everything work for you, not, you got to stay modern. Yeah. And, and the, the thing for me there, one, one line, I, I can't remember whether it was Paul Graham or Sam Altmaier stole it from, but it's just encouraging these startups to be appropriately lazy. 
Like, let us do the hard work. Let us do the undifferentiated heavy lifting so people can come up with these super cool yeah, yeah. ideas. Yeah, just plug in the talent, plug in the developer, you got a modern application. Paul, thank you for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Thank you. Head of Startup Solution Architecture North America, Amazon Web Services is going to continue to birth more startups. That will be unicorns and decacorns now. Don't forget the decacorns. Okay, we're here at theCUBE bringing you all the action. I'm John Furrier, theCUBE. You're watching the leader in global tech coverage. We'll be right back.